So tonight's focus is on Palestinian prisoners. So tomorrow is Palestinian Prisoner Day. It's obviously a really important day annually for us anyway as activists around the Palestinian cause, but it's obviously more uh, pertinent at the moment given the um, uh, coronavirus uh, situation and the fact that if that gets into Palestinian prisons that will be very difficult for those prisoners and will spread very rapidly. I'm sure lots of you have been involved in discussions as well around the situation in Gaza but also in the West Bank and the lack of access to um, medical equipment so we are obviously rightly uh, concerned about this. Um, We'll be running a number of actions. James, one of our PSC staff members, is in here and he will be posting stuff into the chat for you around the actions that we'll be asking you to take. Some of them are broader actions around Gaza, making sure you're a PSC member, but also there are some specific asks for tomorrow. So we want people to be active on social media. Um, and also we have a new petition that we've started um, ahead of Palestinian Prisoner Day. Um, we have two great speakers, um, so we're going to run this so that we have one speaker and then we'll have a question and answer session that will run following that, and then the second speaker. So our first speaker is Brad Parker, who's from Defence for Children International Palestine. Um, DCI Palestine advocate for child prisoners, promoting and protecting their human rights. They monitor and document cases and they provide free legal aid. They're an absolutely fantastic organization. Uh, I know that we meet with them regularly when we're out in Palestine and we know they're doing fantastic work. So it'll be really interesting to hear from Brad. And then uh, we have Randall Harvey from the Adamir Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association. It's an association that was established in 1992. Uh, it provides free legal aid to political prisoners, advocates for their rights both nationally and internationally. Uh, works uh, and does work to end torture and other violations. Both of those organisations have really good websites and we're going to share the links to their websites into the chat, but we will also email all of the information out afterwards. Um, and they're also both very active on social media. So again, you can follow both organisations on, on social media. We'll share that into the chat box as well. And you can make sure that you're following them, sharing the information, um, that they, uh, they provide. So it's really good to see so many of you here. We're over 160 people now, which is excellent. Um, and I'm really looking forward to our speakers. Just somebody has asked that, that you are all muted. Uh, that's because it causes lots of difficulties with background noise if people aren't muted. So just so you're aware of that. Um, and as I said, if, if you can put in the chat box where you're from, that'll be good because then people can see where which parts of the countries people are from. Uh, and say hello to people and also put in any comments or questions and we'll make sure that we save all the chat anyway. Uh, so if there are questions that don't get answered, please don't worry, we'll make sure we answer them uh, when we email out after. So I'm now gonna hand over to Brad uh, from DCI Palestine, who's gonna talk for about 15 minutes. Okay, thanks and welcome, Brad. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see so many folks joining. Um, Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to the PSC, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to partner uh, with you on all these issues. And the uh, the membership is always so active; it's it's really a pleasure uh, to see so many faces and uh, you know help us carry the work forward um, in the UK. Um, I want to give start off by sort of giving a bit of background and context. Um, many of you might be familiar with it, but I think. Um, sort of setting up the situation for Palestinian child detainees in the Israeli military detention system is, is sort of important to, to really fully understanding uh, the moment that we're in now uh, in some of the actions and calls for release that, that um, we're pursuing with, with Adamir and, and, and other organizations, um, both in Palestine, but also globally, um, as prisoners really do face a, a significant threat from the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So first, much of what I talk about, um, essentially all of what I talk about when it comes to the experience of children uh, during arrest and interrogation, detention comes from our legal uh, aid that we provide to, to children and families. Um, we provide legal aid to children charged in the Israeli military courts. Um, so uh, prison visits, affidavits, communications with 
children and their families on the ill treatment they face uh, is is the the evidence base that that we rely on in our advocacy and uh, our public presentations, etc. Uh, so that's sort of just the first background point. Um, on the context, right? So we talk about. Uh, the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, what that means um, in the context of, of military detention, military courts, is that uh, in 1967, when Israeli forces occupied the, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, uh, they instituted military law system. Uh, military law system uh, means that a, a military commander has executive, judicial, and legislative authority over the entire area. Right? So Palestinians don't have any say in the laws that uh, get created, how they're up, they don't vote for anybody that implements and applies those laws. Right? They have no civic uh, rights uh, as it relates to the military law. Uh, a military commander essentially, uh, you know, types up an order, military order, on a piece of paper, signs it, and then that becomes part of the law that applies to Palestinians located in the occupied territory. Um, it just as a sense of what the scope of those laws are, um, right? They military orders. There's there's over, uh, I think, approaching about 1,800 military orders at the moment. Um, they touch on everything from you know what will be the focus here, um, sort of criminal offenses or security offenses, as they're they're termed under one specific military order. Um, they relate to housing, property, um, sort of all kinds of different issues that affect daily life uh, for Palestinians in the occupied territory. Um, sort of important to the conversation today is, is a specific military order, it's the 1651, um, and it relates to uh, security provisions or security offensives. Um, so this military order, uh, the specific offenses included in it look in some ways similar to uh, a criminal code that you'd be familiar with uh, in your own domestic context, uh, but it also includes more political motivated uh, offenses, uh, or what we could say is sort of occupation related um, charges, right? So what that means for children, uh, overwhelmingly children are charged in the military courts with throwing stones. Throwing stones is a specific charge under the military law um, which is unique in the sense that, you know, in the U.S. here where I am, uh, or in the U.K., right, there isn't a specific charge for stone throwing. Right? You might have uh, property damage, assault, battery, uh, sort of a more traditional criminal offense, uh, but under the Israeli military law, the specific charge is throwing stones. The potential penalties, right, and this is sort of key, uh, you throw a stone at uh, a fixed military installation. So for folks that have been to the West Bank, been to Jerusalem and seen the concrete separation barrier, right? if you throw a stone towards that wall, uh, you don't have to cause any damage. You don't have to sort of even hit the wall with the stone, right? It's the conduct of throwing the stone. Um, that comes with a potential 10 year maximum sentence under the military law. If you throw a stone into uh, traffic uh, at a moving object, that comes with a potential 20 year maximum sentence. So just on that one narrow charge, you see how uh, right, it can be used um, to create a lot of leverage over um, individuals alleged to have, have committed a security offense under the, the military law. Um, I'm sure Rhonda will sort of talk a little bit more about the scope of, of the law and how it encapture, captures sort of more political offenses, um, infringing different rights from free speech, right to association, things like that. Uh, but for child prisoners, right, the, the main charge is, is throwing stones. Just to give a sense of the numbers. Um, so uh, at the end of January, which was the, the last sort of official Israel prison service data released, um, there were 183 Palestinian children held in Israeli detention. Um, this number is just a snapshot. So it's essentially a head count on the last day of the month um, that gives an where we can pull an estimate of, of the number of children arrested each year. Um, and we, we, you know, based on our legal representation, based on the IPS figures, it's about 500 to 700 kids um, each year on average that are arrested and prosecuted in the Israeli military court system. 
Uh, the Israeli military court system is unique uh, in many ways. Um, in, in its uniqueness related to child prisoners is that it's the only military, so it's the only, um, Israel is the only country that automatically and systematically prosecutes children in a military court system. Um, over the years, we've seen kind of one-off cases, a handful of cases uh, of children being prosecuted in military courts, whether it's been in Lebanon or Egypt um, and a few other places. Uh, but in the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, if you're a child that is detained by Israeli forces, you are automatically prosecuted in that military court system, um, which, which uh, lacks basic due process protections kind of fundamentally across the board as part of the military law um, requirements. So that's a little bit about the, just the background. Um, what we've documented for really, you know, going on two decades now, uh, is the widespread systematic ill treatment and abuse of Palestinian children uh, at the hands of Israeli forces uh, when they're detained, um, often from their homes in the middle of the night uh, from the West Bank. Um, that ill treatment takes the form of, you know, punching, kicking, uh, being hit with a helmet, being hit with a rifle, um, to psychological abuse, right, and interrogation, uh, using informants to pressure children to confess to crimes that they may or may not have uh, been involved in. Um, it's a whole range of sort of psychological pressure and abuse uh, that kids, kids experience. Um, the current situation is, is a little bit Right. In some ways, nothing has changed. Uh, Pre-trial detention is the norm for children. Uh, this is this is the situation that we've experienced, um, you know, for the past 10, 12 years. Uh, children charged in the military courts rarely get bail. Right. You're arrested um, from your home in the middle of the night, say around 2 a.m. Uh, you'll be put in a jeep, bound and blindfolded, transferred to a military base uh, somewhere nearby, likely. Uh, when Israeli interrogators start their work uh, at a police station nearby, often in an Israeli settlement, you'll find yourself in an interrogation room, um, right, bound, blindfolded. You don't have access to your family. Uh, you don't have access to an attorney. Um, you are essentially alone. Uh, and this is kind of the process, right? What we find from our work is that uh, if you have a system where there's no oversight over arrests, there's no independent sort of fact finding or evidence gathering uh, to justify a charge, right? the, the interrogation process is used specifically to create some incriminating uh, information, evidence, statements that can be used to pass to a military prosecutor um, to then and have charged you in the military court. So the interrogation serves as the vehicle to do that in the majority of cases. Um, from there, right, we see children detained in pretrial detention, right? Uh, the first court hearing uh, after they've been detained and interrogated will be uh, essentially a hearing to extend their detention to the end of legal proceedings, right? Which uh, is pretrial detention. Uh, as a norm, bail's denied. And this is uh, almost the exact opposite situation that we see with uh, Israeli children uh, detained under the Israeli civilian system, right? Where children's rights are respected uh, generally in line with international law, right? Uh, international law demands for children that detention be, is, is only a measure of last resort, uh, that all decisions uh, related to a child's, uh, the best interests of the child should be the primary consideration, right? And we see that being implemented uh, for Israeli children uh, in the civil system, but in the military court system, right, it's, it's sort of the complete opposite. So while children are detention in, in sort of the current context now, right, the children are held in sort of group rooms or group cells. So you could have anywhere from uh, two, three, up to eight to 10 children in the same uh, room, right, with bunk beds. Uh, if you imagine yourself and all of the, the, the best practices and guidelines that um, are suggested around COVID-19, 
and social distancing. You know, it's, it's impossible for uh, prisoners, children in this context to actually have any control over, um, you know, implementing those guidelines for themselves to protect their own, their health. Uh, soap, sanitation, right? Uh, rooms are rarely disinfected. Um, you know, most recently, uh, it, it, at least two of the prisons where the majority of Palestinian child prisoners are held, um, the sort of shared common yard is being disinfected uh, on a regular basis, but the, the rooms of the prisoners, particularly the children, are not being touched. Um, this is highly kind of problematic in a context where you have often unsanitary shared bathrooms, uh, people living in very close proximity, um, touching a lot of the same things, living in the same spaces, right? You can't stay away from each other. Um, so what we've done over the past, I guess it was in, in mid-March, um, DCI Palestine put out a statement calling for the release of, of all Palestinian child prisoners um, due to the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, since then, we created a petition uh, through our No Way to Treat a Child campaign, which um, if you haven't heard of it yet, uh, it's, it's a campaign that focuses specifically on policymakers. We've uh, started the campaign in the U.S., focusing on Congress uh, over the past couple of years, uh, and have recently had two different pieces of legislation introduced by members of Congress on the issues. Um, and we've expanded to Canada, and, and we have plans to, to, to expand to the U.K. Um, in the coming months. Um, so through the campaign, we've, we've issued a, a petition uh, gathering names uh, of individuals that will demand and, and call also for the release of Palestinian child prisoners. Um, I'm sure that James will be sharing that in the chat, and if not, <laughs> be sure to have uh, that sent around afterwards. So I encourage you all to, you know, given the sort of urgency of the situation on so many levels for so many different vulnerable populations, um, keep Palestinian children and Palestinian prisoners in your thoughts uh, and, and take action on their behalf tomorrow. Um, and also, I think the you know, it's a really important moment to lift up just prisoner and detention issues around the globe. Um, here in the US, we obviously are the leader um, in, in incarceration. Um, there's a lot of work happening to connect the, the plight of Palestinian children with prisoners here in the US. Uh, and I think those connections are really, really important uh, given the, you know, the, the uniqueness of the military court system, the military law system as it applies to Palestinians, right? The, the experience of detention, the experience of isolation and the, the risks that people face in detention are common amongst uh, all people. Um, so I think it's a, a really important moment to, to lift up Palestinian prisoners tomorrow, but also in the context that we're in, really shed a light on uh, the plight of all prisoners uh, and all people in detention around the globe. Okay, thanks, Brad. That was uh, very informative, really uh, good. Um, so we have had quite a lot of questions. Uh, so I'm going to go through a, a few of them. Some of them have been answered in the chat. Um, somebody's asked about whether any child prisoners, they've heard that child prisoners have, um, have developed COVID-19 fr from being in prison. Uh, they've heard that there are four child prisoners with that. Is, do you have any information about that? Yeah, so the, the information our lawyers were able to get yesterday were, I think there were three child prisoners at Offer Prison, which is a prison in the West Bank between Ramallah and Jerusalem. Um, there are three suspected cases uh, of, of, of children, um, but they tested negative, so they were removed from the population for three days and then uh, returned. Um, the one big obstacle I should flag is that so our lawyers aren't able to visit children um, at the moment because of the, 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 the policies implemented by the Israeli military authorities. Um, they're also, the military courts are conducting hearings uh, by video conference, often with detainees uh, absent from the proceedings. So the, you know, the measures kind of implemented by Israeli authorities to, you know, protect prisoners, right, have also kind of further, uh, 
fractured the relationships and, and ability to have access to the outside world. Um, for Palestinian children too, it means uh, you know they don't they don't get phone calls regularly when they're in prison. Um, so that's still the case uh, in the two prisons where the majority of Palestinian children are held. So no court right? they don't see anybody at uh, a court hearing. Uh, they're not able to meet with their, their lawyers or families um, in person. Uh, and then phone calls are, are disrupted as well. So it's, it's really, you know, on our side to document and monitor what's happening in the, in detention for children. Um, there are obstacles there, but it's also kind of the bigger picture is that uh, prisoners have a much more limited uh, access to the outside world than they, they did even previously. Okay, brilliant. Thanks. Well, you've answered one of the other questions, which is about prisoners not having visitors. So I'm assuming that, um, that that's answered that one. Um, somebody had asked in the chat about schools being closed, which we know that they are. Um, somebody's asked, has there been an increase in children being questioned or arrested? Is there any evidence of that, given that they're no longer in school for like a significant amount during the day? Not so far that, that we've necessarily seen. I think, you know, uh, not being so schools being closed go hand in hand with um, Palestinian Authority um, states of emergency with emergency directives that um, people just stay home um, and and I think hand in hand right there there's not it doesn't mean kids are sort of out on the streets or uh, getting into mischief which teenagers can do <laughs> from time to time um, so we haven't necessarily seen that I think Israeli forces are still conducting raids, they're still arresting and sort of entering different um, cities throughout the West Bank. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 we'll see sort of as it develops, I guess, and, and sort of returned from the short term to long term, if there are sort of different trends that, that come from the different closures. But so far, uh, things have been um, fairly status quo. Okay, thanks. Right, there's just been a couple of questions about ages. So what age, at what age does a child become an adult under military law? But also somebody's asked, how long can children be, be detained? Um, and is there any age limit for them being detained? Yeah, so the, the age of majority under the military law is 18 years old. Um, so it is in line with the international standard. Um, several years, I mean, it's more than 10 years ago now, I think. Um, we had pushed for, it used to be under military law, the age was 16 uh, for age of majority and uh, under Israeli civilian law, it was 18. That was corrected in, in 2011 under the military law and brought in line with international standards. However, uh, it, it, the problem is that it doesn't, it, the age of majority change didn't actually impact other military orders. So for example, children can 16 to 17 years old can still be sentenced as adults, um, right? So there's a range of military law provisions that really had no bearing or, you know, were not adjusted at all based on that age of majority change. Um, and there's a lot more detail there to sort of go into um, if we have more time. Um, and just to say on the front end, right, the, the age of criminal responsibility under Israeli military law and Israeli civilian law is, is 12 years old. Uh, so the military courts don't have jurisdiction over any child below 12 years. Uh, however, we see children being detained. Um, you know, I think some of the more pro high profile videos that come out from the West Bank are, are younger children below the age of 12 that have been detained by soldiers uh, for shorter periods, maybe pulled into a, a, a military container at a checkpoint, questioned, and then sort of re later released several hours later. So those kind of more informal detentions do happen of younger children, but you won't be prosecuted in the military court if you're, if you're below 12. Okay, thank you. And then um, somebody just asked if you could explain in more detail how the military courts don't provide due process to child prisoners once they have been detained. So the sort of process after detention. Yeah, so we, we have a lot of information uh, on our website and different reports sort of documenting the due process violations. I think the clearest, kind of most accessible point to make in a, a very clear, short, concise way is that um, you know, there is no right to, an, children don't have a right to an attorney during interrogation, right? Um, so there's, 
often no third party uh, in the room. Um, so if we have a child that's experienced physical violence uh, during an interrogation, which is a clear form of torture, um, and there's a, a, an incriminating statement that comes out of that interrogation, right? what happens in the military court, uh, if we raise that with the, the military court judge, which remember is uh, an active duty or reserve duty officer in the Israeli military, um, right? Uh, so that the word of the soldier, the word of the interrogator uh, always trumps the word of the child, right? Um, and without a third party uh, witness, even a video camera, um, that's often not it's not possible to to really refute and, and establish um, for the judge, you know, that this actually happened. The other side, sort of on due process, is uh, military courts because they're active or reserve duty officers. Right? They're they're not impartial. They're not independent, um, and that's kind of the the major red flag when it comes to due process. Uh, you have a military that's implementing an occupation, arresting and detaining also deciding uh, on, on uh, and adjudicating all of the cases, right? So um, to think about the court system as a justice system or a system that's interested in justice at, at all is, is really, you know, it's not. Uh, it's, it's essentially doing exactly what it's intended to, uh, which is arresting, detaining um, adolescent boys, uh, you know, in the case of child prisoners, uh, as a means to control a population, which is the goal of an occupation, right? It's, it's not about holding individuals accountable for specific wrongdoing. Uh, it's, you know, if we arrest this many boys from this community in this location, uh, which tend to be near a, a settlement, uh, near the separation barrier, right? Near places where the, the Israeli occupation has its infrastructure, right? If we arrest so many children from these communities, uh, it's going to have them step in line and, and think twice about uh, resisting in any form, uh, whether it's nonviolent uh, marches, protests against the, the occupation, et cetera. Um, so it, it really is not about justice and, and much uh, you know, primarily about controlling a population. Okay, thanks, Brenda. We've got a couple of minutes left. Quite a lot of people have asked about the ICC, International Criminal Courts judgment, and if you've got any views on that, and also the role of the UN. Uh, so I don't know if you want to just sum up with any comments about those two organizations. Yeah, just this is a small, <laughs> small <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, so on the ICC, I think the you know, uh, who knows, I'm a, often a cynical optimist, but mostly more cynical than optimistic about most of these things. Uh, I think the ICC currently, for folks that are following the process, um, it's, it's a positive sort of development over the past few months that uh, the Office of the Prosecutor has determined there's a reasonable basis um, to believe that war crimes are being committed or have been committed uh, and trying to kick it to the investigation stage. But at the same time, uh, I think there's a political consideration being taken by her and trying to lock in um, that investigation, uh, which is a little bit rolling the dice uh, because they've, she asked uh, another body within the, the court to rule on the territorial jurisdiction of, you know, what are, what is the state of Palestine and, and you know, where crimes happen. Uh, if there is no clear state of Palestine borders, does that mean that they can't sort of adjudicate uh, any of the crimes? So there's a lot of uncertainty. I think there's a, you know, there's a clear sort of way forward, um, but the, the recent developments, while positive, have also opened the door um, to have, you know, opened the door to have it just slammed in someone's face, I guess, is the, if I continue with the metaphor. Um, and then I think on the UN side, right, the, similarly, I mean, the lack of political will to address Palestinian rights in uh, any way, to some degree, right, is pervasive. Um, that exists throughout UN agencies, uh, UN institutions, um, UN member states, and the permanent rep offices. I mean, it's just a kind of outright unwillingness to prioritize Palestinian rights. Um, and and I think over the years on at least the, the Palestinian child prisoners issue, right, you've seen 
some really robust and sort of bold um, actions. And UNICEF released a report in 2013 that I think really was groundbreaking to have a, a UNICEF report that essentially documents um, and, and shares, you know, the conclusions that, that Adamir and DCI Palestine had been documenting for, for years and years. Um, you know, it, it helped bring awareness on the issues to a different level. Uh, it, it helped sort of bring uh, dialogue and discussion and, and, and sort of raise the issue with policymakers in a different way than I think we were able to maybe do previously. Um, but it sort of stops there, right? I think you ask for concrete actions and, and you know, it's like, well, we, we, we got this report out. It's really creating a lot of discussion. Um, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> Since 2013, we're, you know, you know, at best in a similar spot, um, but I think realistically in a much worse spot um, when it comes to these issues. So, I think there's uh, there's always the political considerations that that come in to really tamp down anything that might have some viability um, from you know the local UN agency staff and things like that. So. Uh, political will is the problem. That's why I'm happy to see all of your faces and, you know, what are we up to? 194 people <laughs> uh, helping us force change in that political will because ultimately, right, it's, it's, it's about people mobilizing, um, right? We've been asking and asking and asking for years and we really should be forcing change uh, and it really takes mobilized efforts and, and all of you coming together to, to be able to do that. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Brad. Uh, a very, very good answers. We, uh, there are a few more uh, questions that have come up, so we'll try and answer those. James might try and answer them in the chat. If not, we'll make sure when we um, respond, like in the last one, we respond to any questions. I have to say a lot of the questions will be answered on DCI Palestine's website. So if you go on there, a lot of the questions that are coming up would be there if you go on and have a look. And James has just shared the website, so you can uh, go and have a look. So I'm going to hand over to Amanda now from Adamia. So she's going to speak again for about 15 minutes. Again, if you put your questions in the chat, I'll make sure I write them down uh, and we'll try and get some time with Amanda too. But thanks again, Brad. I'll unmute you, Amanda. There you go. Oh. Thank you all I am unmuted now, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us today. It's really heartwarming and uplifting to see so many people interested in knowing um, what is happening with the prisoners right now. It's such an urgent time for all of us to act globally for the freedom of all people behind bars, but particularly for us working with Palestinian human rights organizations and seeing how the illegal occupation has really um, created such a um, dire situation for prisoners. We're just asking people to act. Um, so what I wanted to do today is um, just give a little snapshot of the current conditions of what's happening um, to Palestinian prisoners and detainees amid the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I, again, I just want to reiterate that I'm speaking on behalf of Ademir Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association. Just like DCI, we're also a legal association that um, provides free legal aid to Palestinian political prisoners in the military courts and in the civil courts in Jerusalem. We also take a lot of cases to uh, the Supreme Court to try to um, to gain more rights and better conditions for the prisoners in the meantime as we simultaneously attempt to um, gain their freedom. Um, so I'm going to be speaking a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing um, lately. And the reason I want to really focus on the conditions that are happening right now is because we're seeing a lot of restrictive measures that are being put in place as emergency regulations um, to protect people um, due to the to, to coronavirus. But we are seeing or we are deeply concerned that these measures are going to remain in practice once we are in the clear um, after uh, the coronavirus pandemic has passed. And um, the reason that we are so concerned about this is that um, at the beginning of 2019, uh, the Israeli Minister of Public Security, Gilad Erdan, um, made a new policy measure that was to deliberately worsen the conditions for Palestinian political prisoners. He stated that this was, and I quote, his moral duty and obligation to Israeli citizens to do so. Um, and I just bring this up because I want to show the way that Palestinians are constantly dehumanized by um, 
and by Israeli law, by Israeli politicians and Israeli society, and are completely criminalized in which the already unbearable conditions are deliberately made worse to try to break in their will and their spirit and to try to break our attempt uh, for justice and liberation and freedom. Um, so some of uh, Erdan's plan that was implemented included um, a ton of restrictions and punishments of the prisoners. For example, there was an attempt uh, that he said um, he claimed that they were using far too much water in their cell so he restricted the water supply against the Palestinian prisoners they removed showers from the cell blocks um, for all prisoners reduced family visits which are already at twice a month for 45 minutes each and I will discuss that more in detail later um, revoked the ability for uh, prisoners to cook for themselves and um, he wants um, and he claims that they should be eating food that's made by the prison because they don't have the right to make food that um, that they like to eat and they should be subjected to prison food. Um, limiting access to television, which is oftentimes their only outlet to the outside world to see the news, to be connected with what is happening um, on a global scale. Denying visits from Knesset parliamentarians who might be showing solidarity or trying to learn of the conditions of the prisoners. And also um, separating prisoners uh, by faction, so not allowing them to be with their friends or their comrades in order to try to create divisions and tension between the prisoners. So these are some of the um, measures that have been implemented by um, Gilad Erdan, and it's um, been a slow, uh, a slow process that they've he's been uh, they've been implementing these in the prisons. There were hunger strikes last year where the prisoners and detainees were fighting back against these condi um, these conditions and uh, and were somewhat successful in them. Um, and now we're seeing that a lot of these measures are being implemented as coronavirus preventative measures, and it's not for the protection of the prisoners, but rather to isolate them and to punish them. So uh, since early March, since, um, since coronavirus entered Palestine, the West Bank and Israel, the Israel, Israeli prison service put in um, emergency regulations that have also worsened the conditions. And I just wanna highlight several of them that have been really deeply affecting the prisoners. Um, the first is that there is an outright denial of family visits for all detainees and prisoners. And this was the first measure that was implemented by the IPS uh, at the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, and I just wanna highlight also that this is oftentimes the first uh, form of punishment that's put uh, placed against prisoners when they start a hunger strike, they are denied family visits. If they have tried any other form of um, of uh, an action inside the prison. They're denied family visits. Many family members are denied from visits in, in the first place uh, as a security measure against them. So oftentimes, um, uh, first degree family members that are between the ages of 16 and 45 are not allowed into the prisons for visits in general. And so this is even further restricting them um, from being able to visit their family members. Uh, after the work of Adamir and Adala, who had been petitioning in the Supreme Court since the beginning of March, um, on April 2nd, uh, the IPS finally declared that oh, children would be allowed to um, have a 15 minute phone call once every two weeks. Um, uh, with a family member. However, this phone call had to be number one approved and authorized by the Israeli prison service. So they had to confirm that the call would not um, would not uh, cause any security um, issues. And of course, when I say security issues, I say it a bit, you know, like ironically, because we know that there's a lot of things that that there's a lot of ways that they um, create so-called security conditions to keep family members from being able to speak. And second of all, um, and is um, and a member of the Israeli prison service would have to be present on the call and can terminate the call at any moment. So of course, this is just a form of surveillance against these child detainees. They have been uncomfortable with being able to talk to their family members. Um, 
or they have been um, or they have had the calls terminated and even though only a few of them have actually been able and successful to talk to their family members during this period they're under very very heavy surveillance so we can see that this isn't a humanitarian measure but rather one to try to continue to cull information from them the second measure that has been implemented, which we have been heavily um, working on at Ademir, is that there's been a denial of face-to-face -face lawyer visits. And this was put in place immediately after family visits were halted. Um, so all court procedures, like Brad um, stated, are being done um, by phone or video conference. Um, oftentimes, in our cases, they have stated the video conference doesn't work. It took a long time for them to be um, uh, implemented and all court procedures except for um, uh, cases of detention extensions and confirmation of administrative detention and appeals have been completely halted. Um, and so there, so we've had a lot of access, be, uh, a lot of difficulty accessing our clients and being able to talk to them. Um, we are unable, oftentimes we are only unable, are able to talk to them by fo uh, phone and not video and therefore um, we cannot like confirm what the conditions of the detention is um, or if they are actually okay. Of course, we assume and presume that there is monitoring of all of these conversations. So this isn't adequate um, legal counsel at all. Um, and I just want to also point out that um, about a fourth of Palestinians who are detained, currently there's uh, about 5,000 Palestinians that are incarcerated, a fourth of them are not charged or have just been recently charged and are under pretrial. Um, so, uh, and they're waiting trial. So they have not even been found guilty, uh, even under the circumstances of the Israeli military court. Um, and if you include uh, the 430 Palestinians who are under administrative detention, meaning that they are detained under secret files without charge or trial, this number jumps to 32.7%. So a third of the Palestinians who are currently incarcerated and imprisoned have not even been found guilty of a crime under Israeli military code as of now. And I think this is just shocking to show that they can absolutely be released, even by the standards of Israeli military occupation, they have not been found to be threatening to the Israeli state and they should be released immediately. And that is part of our campaign right now amid coronavirus is that they, um, that uh, the, all of those who are under pretrial should be released immediately. But it also draws attention to the fact that this, um, the Israeli military court system and is Israeli military code is simply to control and hold captive the Palestinian population and to try, to try to isolate us from one another, to try to have Palestinians from organizing with one another for our freedom. And we see this with these staggering pretrial numbers. Um, so we are uh, fairly afraid um, that uh, these, um, these uh, new regulations of having teleconferences with our clients in place of in lieu of face-to-face uh, -face meetings are going to continue far past uh, the coronavirus pandemic. We know that Israel can, um, functions under emergency law since 1948, so it would, it would not be far out of their reach to implement these procedures um, in this moment that had been initially put in place because of the pandemic. And this is something that we're um, keeping an eye out for and will constantly be advocating for us to see our clients um, face to face and to be able to have access to them to provide them adequate counseling. Um, in addition to that, the conditions, of course, are continuously getting worse. Um, the prisoners have not been provided with any protective gear to, to protect themselves. Brad talked a little bit about the lack of sanitation inside the prisons. Um, that is the case for adult prisoners as well. In fact, uh, um, since the pandemic broke out, there has been a um, revocation of over 100 products from the prison canteen, which is how Palestinians 
companies are able to get their basic um, personal hygiene and sanitation products. They are not afforded any like alcohol. They don't have hand sanitizer. They don't have masks. Um, and they're only, they can only purchase Clorox as the, their only protective measure um, to sanitize their cells, which they have to purchase as well. Um, so the conditions are incredibly harsh. Um, inside the prisons, there's still um, daily counts and only until about last week did the, um, the prison service start wearing protective gear. Before that, they were entering the cells without wearing any kind of protective gear at all. Um, they also check the window, the small windows inside the cells twice a day and are constantly entering. The conditions of the cells themselves are um, terrible. Uh, there's tons of overcrowding. There's eight uh, detainees or prisoners per cell. There's humidity, there's insects, there's pests. They don't have access to clean water. It's just, it's basically a, it's a breeding ground for the coronavirus to enter. Um, and they're absolutely terrified about it. The, of course, the IPS does not provide them with any information about what is happening. We have just been seeing a lot of detainees being quarantined um, and not being told why and having their temperatures being checked just twice a day, but not being checked other than that. So this is obviously some form of like psychological warfare against the prisoners and their families who are unable to check on each other who uh, prisoners who don't know what's happening to their own bodies and if they have been if they have contracted or been exposed to coronavirus um, and the quarantine conditions themselves are horrific we've had um, several cases of detainees one as young as 18 Mahmoud Atta who was put in a quarantine cell that was like a solitary confinement cell for 14 days. He was not given any clothing. He had no shower in the cell. He had nothing in there um, and he wasn't told what was happening to him as well. So these are, these are like the incredibly difficult conditions that they're facing. And then finally, before closing, I just want to mention that the arrest campaigns are continuing. Um, we have had um, over, uh, nearly 400, 357 Palestinians who have been arrested since the beginning of March. Um, and that includes 48 children and seven women who have been arrested. And during a time when um, Palestinians have heavily implemented home quarantine, they're trying to protect themselves using what we know is the most effective form of protection against this virus. And the only one that we really have in the West Bank considering the lack of medical um, supplies and access that Palestinians have. And despite all this, the Israeli, um, Israeli military continues to raid uh, refugee camps, villages, towns, cities. Just last week, they arrested um, a Palestinian activist in Ramallah uh, just for one night um, and exposed the, their entire family to potentially to the virus. They um, they entered their home, they, they ransacked the home. And so these things are still continuing despite a, a global lockdown and an attempt globally to flatten the curve. And this is extremely concerning, but also shows that the occupation continues to entrench itself despite, um, uh, despite the coronavirus and shows that this is an attempt, the coronavirus is being used against prisoners as a way to further isolate them, to, um, to further um, punish them. And so I just wanna close by saying, what can we do as an international community? We can't just ingest all of this information and know that this is happening and not take action. So I encourage you all to join um, the campaign uh, by Defense for Children International, but also we need to continue fighting and organizing. Um, and we at Adamir, we believe that people should not be caged and particularly in our context, especially those who are arrested under military occupation. And so we ask you to join our campaigns as well. We are currently asking people to post videos of themselves or photos of themselves or words of solidarity that call for the release of all prisoners. And this is extremely important to um, 
to uplift the families, to uplift the prisoners themselves and know that there are people standing with them um, through this injustice. And we also um, are asking um, people to organize in their home countries to put pressure on their elective representatives to care about this issue and demand that Israel uphold the Geneva Conventions and release these prisoners. And, and the same goes for uh, putting pressure on international organizations, the United Nations and the ICRC should intervene immediately for the release of these prisoners, especially as they cannot guarantee their safety right now. So we know that if we work together and we can show these prisoners a solidarity, solidarity they need and deserve right now as their lives are under attack, this is the only way that we're going to guarantee their freedom. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Again, a very powerful testimony, very moving. I'm sure people are quite shocked by, uh, or very shocked by a lot of the things that you have just told us. We've got a few questions and we have got time for, we've got time for a couple of questions. But just before that, just a reminder, I know I can see James is putting lots of stuff in the chat about actions that you can take. Please make sure you download those, but we will email them out as well. Uh, Randa's just referred to some actions you can take um, through her organization and DCI have a lot of actions on their web website. And of course, to all of you, if you're not currently a member of Palestine Solidarity Campaign, please make sure you join. It's vital, you know, vital at this time that we increase our membership uh, and continue to do the campaigning work that we do. Um, so I will remind you about that again. But anyway, just a couple of questions. Um, this, this was asked in the previous um, uh, block as well, but I didn't, uh, I didn't ask it because it was child prisoners, but uh, somebody's asked about, can we write to prisoners? I, I don't know what the view is about that, Randa. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, so the short answer is yes, you can write to prisoners. Will the letter get to the prison? Um, very unlikely, and it might get there you know, six months later. Um, so what we ask people to do is to write letters and then send them to us directly at Damir. We collect them for the prisoners and then we give them to them upon their release. Um, and uh, sometimes people write, like, uh, write a letter and send it into the prison and also send us a photo of it. And um, uh, one thing that the Israeli prison service was recommending in lieu of family visits was that family members write to, um, their family members inside prison, but we know from extensive history that they read the letters or that they don't arrive for months at a time. But this was their solution to try to keep the families uh, to, to, uh, in order to not um, allow family visits. But we do encourage people to write to them. And if you send it to us first, um, we can guarantee that they will get them um, upon their release. Okay, and are the details for doing that on your website, Manda? Yes. Through the website. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, then a couple just about length of sentences and what happens. So I'll, I'll sort of clump them together. So the first question was about what is the average uh, length of a prison sentence? Then the longest period of detention without being charged. And then thirdly, there was a question around are prison, prisoners released in exchange for them becoming informers? Okay. Okay, so for the first question, it really varies. The sentences are very, very high. Um, so for example, for stone throwing, um, the sentence for throwing a rock at a military tank, for example, for an, um, a, moving, a moving object is 20 years. Um, we don't often, however, we don't often see that um, being implemented. What we do see is that um, we will see like a, someone being arrested and then having a list of charges against them that are like 20 or 30 um, charges at length. Um, uh, so for example, they and we often see a lot of retroactive um, charging. So for example, there was someone who was arrested uh, last year who was uh, charged for um, stone throwing in 2006. So we see that happen oftentimes. Um, 
uh, and we see that uh, so oftentimes we don't see people being sentenced for the maximum sentence, but rather there's a compounding number of charges so that our lawyers are trying to um, negotiate a much lower sentence for them. But there are many uh, Palestinians who are held under um, uh, ex excruciatingly long sentences or charges or um, compounded charges, but it's just hard to say. Um, we see a lot of maximum sentences. There is no death penalty in the Israeli military court at present, but we have a lot of detainees who have multiple life sentences, effectively meaning that they are going to be detained for life. Um, the second Oh, I didn't answer what the average is. To be honest, I honestly don't know, but I would say that for, um, for stone throwing, we often are seeing a year or so for um, adults. Um, the long, I'm sorry, I didn't write the full questions. Was the second question, what's the longest sentence? Yes, uh, the longest period of detention without being charged. Mm. So you can, so an administrative detention order is issued for a period of up to six months, which can be renewed indefinitely. So we have a lot of cases of Palestinians who are um, under, held under administrative detention, meaning that they're held under secret information that is not available to their uh, lawyer or to them, um, and is just exchanged between the military court judge, who is a soldier, and um, the Israeli intelligence unit, the Shabak. Um, so we see a lot of those being extended for years at a time. Uh, what we see often happen is that someone will be held under administrative detention for two years and then released and then re-arrested again. So for example, we have a, a detainee right now who was released on the 20th of February. Um, after 20 months of administrative detention, he went on hunger strike um, to, to advocate for his release. He was finally released, and then he was rearrested um, at the beginning of March, just weeks after he was um, released and put directly in quarantine and issued another administrative detention order while he was in quarantine. So we see a lot of cases like this, and we've had some um, Detain administrative detainees who over a course of their lifetime have been in administrative detention for a decade. Okay, thank you so much, Randa. Okay, we're at the end of our time now. I want to thank Randa and Brad for their fantastic contributions. I want to thank all of you for your contributions in the chat and for your questions. Um, James has shared all of the actions we're calling on. We want everybody to be doing stuff tomorrow to raise awareness again about Palestinian prisoners. A final reminder, make sure you join Palestine Solidarity Campaign if you haven't already done that. Um, I also want to thank James and actually all the PSC staff. They are all working really hard behind the scenes to make sure that we continue to put Palestine out there and we're fighting and advocating uh, for rights for the Palestinians. So thank you to all the staff for the hard work that they um, continue to do. Please get involved. Please sign up to all the actions and thank you everyone. Thank you, Randa. Thank you, Brad, so much. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, keep your eyes open for the next one. Lots of thumbs up from everyone. Thank you.